The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Book Six, Chapter Two The Rat Hole. The reader must permit us to take him back to the Place de Greve, which we quitted yesterday with Gringoire in order to follow La Esmeralda. It is ten o'clock in the morning. Everything is indicative of the day after a festival. The pavement is covered with rubbish ribbons, rags, feathers from tufts of plumes, drops of wax from the torches, crumbs of the public feast. A goodly number of bourgeois are sauntering, as we say, here and there, turning over with their feet the extinct brands of the bonfire, going into raptures in front of the pillar house over the memory of the fine hangings of the day before, and today staring at the nails that secured them a last pleasure. The vendors of cider and beer are rolling their barrels among the groups. Some busy passers-by come and go. The merchants converse and call to each other from the thresholds of their shops. The festival, the ambassadors, Caponol, the Pope of the Fools, are in all mouths. They vie with each other, each trying to criticize it best and laugh the most. And meanwhile, four mounted sergeants, who have just posted themselves at the four sides of the pillory, have already concentrated around themselves a good proportion of the populace scattered on the place, who condemn themselves to immobility and fatigue in the hope of a small execution. If the reader, after having contemplated this lively and noisy scene which is being enacted in all parts of the place, will now transfer his gaze towards that ancient demi-Gothic, demi-Romanesque house of the Tour Roland, which forms the corner of the quay to the west. He will observe, at the angle of the façade, a large public breviary, with rich illuminations protected from the rain by a little penthouse, and from thieves by a small grating, which, however, permits of the leaves being turned. Besides this breviary is a narrow arched window closed by two iron bars in the form of a cross, and looking on the square. The only opening which admits a small quantity of light and air to a little cell without a door, constructed on the ground floor, in the thickness of the walls of the old house, and filled with a peace all the more profound, with a silence all the more gloomy, because a public place, the most populous and most noisy in Paris, swarms and shrieks around it. This little cell had been celebrated in Paris for nearly three centuries, ever since Madame Roland de la Tour Roland, in mourning for her father who died in the Crusades, had caused it to be hollowed out in the wall of her own house, in order to immure herself there forever, keeping of all her palace only this lodging whose door was walled up, and whose window stood open, winter and summer, giving all the rest to the poor and to God. The afflicted damsel had, in effect, waited twenty years for death in this premature tomb, praying night and day for the soul of her father, sleeping in ashes, without even a stone for a pillow, clothed in a black sack, and subsisting on the bread and water which the compassion of the passers-by led them to deposit on the ledge of her window, thus receiving charity after having bestowed it. At her death, at the moment when she was passing to the other sepulchre, she had bequeathed this one in perpetuity to afflicted women, mothers, widows, or maidens, who should wish to pray much for others or for themselves, and who should desire to inter themselves alive in a great grief or a great penance. The poor of her day had made her a fine funeral, with tears and benedictions, but, to their great regret, the pious maid had not been canonized, or lack of influence. Those among them who were a little inclined to impiety had hoped that the matter might be accomplished in Paradise more easily than at Rome, and had frankly besought God, instead of the Pope, in behalf of the deceased. The majority had contented themselves with holding the memory of Roland sacred, and converting her rags into relics. The city, on its side, had founded, in honor of the Damoiselle, a public breviary, which had been fastened near the window of the cell, in order that passers-by might halt there from time to time, were it only to pray. That prayer might remind them of alms, and that poor recluses, heiresses of Madame Roland's vault, might not die outright of hunger and forgetfulness. 
Moreover, this sort of tomb was not so very rare a thing in the cities of the Middle Ages. One often encountered in the most frequented street, in the most crowded and noisy market, in the very middle, under the feet of the horses, under the wheels of the carts, as it were, a cellar, a well, a tiny walled and grated cabin, at the bottom of which a human being prayed night and day, voluntarily devoted to some eternal lamentation, to some great expiation. And all the reflections which that strange spectacle would awaken in us today, that horrible cell, a sort of intermediary link between a house and the tomb, the cemetery and the city, that living being cut off from the human community, and thenceforth reckoned among the dead, that lamp consuming its last drop of oil in the darkness, that remnant of life flickering in the grave, that breath, that voice, that eternal prayer in a box of stone, that face forever turned towards the other world, that eye already illuminated with another sun, that ear pressed to the walls of a tomb, that soul a prisoner in that body, that body a prisoner in that dungeon cell, and beneath that double envelope of flesh and granite the murmur of that soul in pain. Nothing of all this was perceived by the crowd. The piety of that age, not very subtle nor much given to reasoning, did not see so many facets in an act of religion. It took the thing in the block, honored, venerated, hollowed the sacrifice at need, but did not analyze the sufferings, and felt but moderate pity for them. It brought some pittance to the miserable penitent from time to time, looked through the hole to see whether he were still living, forgot his name, hardly knew how many years ago he had begun to die, and to the stranger, who questioned them about the living skeleton who was perishing in that cellar, the neighbors replied simply, It is the recluse. Everything was then viewed without metaphysics, without exaggeration, without magnifying glass, with the naked eye. The microscope had not yet been invented, either for things of matter or for things of the mind. Moreover, although people were but little surprised by it, the examples of this sort of cloistration in the hearts of cities were in truth frequent, as we have just said. There were in Paris a considerable number of these cells for praying to God and doing penance. They were nearly all occupied. It is true that the clergy did not like to have them empty, since that implied lukewarmness in believers, and that lepers were put into them when there were no penitents on hand. Besides the cell on the Greve, there was one at Montfaucon, one at the Charnier des Innocents, another, I hardly know where, at the Clichon house, I think, others still at many spots where traces of them are found in traditions, in default of memorials. The university had also its own. On Mount saint Genevieve, a sort of Job of the Middle Ages, for the space of thirty years, chanted the seven penitential psalms on a dunghill at the bottom of a cistern, beginning anew when he had finished, singing loudest at night. Magna voce per umbras. And today the antiquary fancies that he hears his voice as he enters the Rue de Puy Qui Parlay, the street of the speaking well. To confine ourselves to the cell in the Tour Roland, we must say that it had never lacked recluses. After the death of Madame Roland, it had stood vacant for a year or two, though rarely. Many women had come thither to mourn until their death for relatives, lovers, faults. Parisian malice, which thrusts its finger into everything, even into things which concern it the least, affirmed that it had beheld but few widows there. In accordance with the fashion of the epoch, a Latin inscription on the wall indicated to the learned passer-by the pious purpose of this cell. The custom was retained until the middle of the sixteenth century of explaining an edifice by a brief device inscribed above the door. Thus one still reads in France, above the wicket of the prison in the seigneurial mansion of Tourville, Sileto et Spira. In Ireland, beneath the armorial bearings which surmount the grand door to Fortescue Castle, Fortescutum Salus Ducum. 
in England, over the principal entrance to the hospitable mansion of the Earl's Cowper, Tuum Est. At that time every edifice was a thought. As there was no door to the walled cell of the Tour Roland, these two words had been carved in large Roman capitals over the window. Tu Ora. And this caused the people, whose good sense does not perceive so much refinement in things, and likes to translate Ludovico Magno by Porte Saint Denis, to give this dark, gloomy, damp cavity the name of the Rat Hole. An explanation less sublime, perhaps, than the other, but on the other hand, more picturesque. End of Book Six, Chapter Two